the son of a tribal elder, the favorite of his mother. He died an Englishman, the father of two daughters, and the husband of an English woman. At the age of 11, Olauda Equiano was kidnapped by Africans and sold to Europeans. When the grown people were gone far in the fields to labor, the children generally assembled together to play. And some of us often used to get up into a tree to look out for any assailant or kidnapper that might come upon us. One day, when only I and my sister were left to mind the house, two men and a woman got over our walls and in a moment seized us both without giving us time to cry out or to make any resistance, they stopped our mouths and ran off with us. Olauda Equiano. Obonye kaye nacho, obonye kaye nacho, ekwano kaye nacho, nzumalizo. Obonye kaye nacho, obonye kaye nacho, ekwano kaye nacho, nzumalizo. Who are we looking for? Who are we looking for? It's a kwano we are looking for, nzumalizo. Has he gone to the stream? Let him come back. Has he gone to the market? Let him come back. Has he gone to the farm? Let him return. It's a kwano we are looking for, nzumalizo. For more than four centuries, people disappeared from the savannas, the rainforests, and the villages of Black Africa. Farmers and craftspeople, commoners and African nobility. Most were strong young men, age 15 to 25. But women and children were also taken and sold. To obtain slaves, Africans waged war, destroying communities, stealing people. To escape the spreading violence, many moved into the interior, abandoning family compounds, farms, entire villages. In West Africa, more than 20 million people were kidnapped into slavery. Only half would survive the journey to the coast. The boy Equiano was one of the survivors. At last, I came to the banks of a large river. I was beyond measure surprised at this as I had never before seen any water larger than a pond or rivulet. And my surprise was mingled with no small fear when I was put into one of these canoes and we began to paddle and move along the river. On the journey to the coast, Equiano passed from one African master to another. Once he was sold for 172 cowrie shells. He learned three different languages, traveled some 800 miles, 
and encountered people and customs unfamiliar and frightening to him. After close to seven months of travel on foot and by boat, he reached the African coast. The first object that saluted my eyes when I arrived on the coast was the sea and a slave ship which was then riding at anchor and waiting for its cargo. These filled me with astonishment that was soon converted into terror. Mulauda Equiam. It was an ancient business, this trade in human beings between Africa and Europe. Fifty years before Columbus sailed to the New World, Portuguese explorers had sailed to West Africa. At first seeking gold, they built a fort in 1482 and called it Elmina, the mine. The Portuguese pointed their guns toward the Atlantic to guard, not against Africans, but against European competitors. Over time, the castle changed hands from the Portuguese to the Dutch, and finally the British. And the trade changed from gold to human beings. Concerning the trade on this coast, we notified your highness already that it has completely changed into a slave coast, and that nowadays the natives no longer occupy themselves with the search for gold, but rather make war on each other in order to furnish slaves. The Gold Coast has changed into a complete slave coast. Willem de la Palma, director, Dutch West India Company. Along the west coast of Africa, from Senegal in the north to the Cameroons in the south, the Europeans built some 60 forts and castles, warehouses for European merchandise and for African slaves. Called factories, they were commercial centers where agents or factors traded rum, cloth, and guns for human beings and gold. The most notable item is the slave house, which lies below ground. It consists of vaulted cellars divided into several apartments which can easily hold a thousand slaves. Captain John Barbeau, French slave trader. In dungeons built deep into the ocean rock, people waited. Sometimes a day, sometimes a year. These chambers would be their last memory of Africa. When a slave ship arrived and anchored off the coast, they would be led out from the darkness to the beach. As the slaves come down to feed her from the inland country, they are put into a booth or prison near the beach. When the Europeans are to receive them, they are brought out into a large plain where the surgeons examine every one of them, all stark naked. Each which have passed as good is marked on the breast with a red-hot iron imprinting the mark of the French, English, or Dutch companies. In this Particular care is taken that the women, as tenderest, be not burnt too hard. Captain John Barbeau, French slave trader. The white people did not need to be present in the interior of Africa. All they needed to do was to supply the weapons. The people they dealt with were um, those coastal peoples right on the, on the, on the coastline who controlled the, the territory down there. So Kwano would not have met 
maybe not even heard of white people. I have found no place where I can enlarge my fortune so soon as where I now live. In this manner, we spend the prime of youth among Negroes, scraping the world for money, the universal god of mankind, until death overtakes us. Nicholas Owen, slave trader. Europeans died like flies in that climate. The average expectation was three or four years, you know, really. And so they had to make money while they could because they knew they didn't have much time. So in that sense, of course, they were, they were trapped. They were caught in the web of the system and held there and died there. The Europeans made more than 54,000 voyages to trade in human beings. No one will ever know the exact number of people taken from the shores of West Africa, but more than 11 million have been counted in the records that remain. Most headed for South America and the Caribbean islands, some half a million to the mainland of North America. December 29th, 1724. No trade today, though many traders came on board. They informed us that the people are gone to war with inland and will bring prisoners enough in two or three days, in hopes of which we stay. December 30th, 1724. No trade yet. But our traders came on board today and informed us the people had burnt four towns of their enemies so that tomorrow we expect slaves. Liverpool surgeon. Received in this cargo 46 men, 34 women, 14 boys, six girls, and 147 chests of corn. The rest of the goods delivered on shore to Cape Coast and Accra to Mr. Harbin. William Dexter, ship's captain. Ship captains were cautioned not to buy all their slaves from one place. Africans who knew each other, who spoke the same language, were more likely to conspire and rebel. There would be maybe 25 seamen and the ship's officers. There might have been a crew of 30. And these 30 had to um, control maybe 300 men, black men and women, who were aware of being abducted and who were, in, who were, who were desperate and who were dangerous because they were obviously waiting to seize any opportunity that was, was offered to, to rebel and to take over the ship and to kill, to kill the crew, and that, that did happen fairly frequently. The only way that this could be contained was by a system of fear. I was now persuaded that I had got into a world of bad spirits and that they were going to kill me. Their complexions, too, differing so much from ours. Their long hair and the language they spoke, which was very different from any I had ever heard, united to confirm me in this belief. I no longer doubted my fate. I asked if we were going to be eaten by those white men with horrible looks, red faces, and long hair. Olauda Equiano. Captains call the voyage from West Africa to the New World the Middle Passage, the middle leg of a triangular course that began and ended in Europe. From English ports, ships sailed to Africa to trade goods for slaves. Then the human cargo was taken to the Americas and traded for raw materials, 
which were then carried back to England and sold. 